Hi everyone. So we are going to be starting a new section in this course where we're going to be focusing on plant growth and development and particularly factors that affect those processes. So before we get into some of those factors, let's define what plant growth and plant development is. So plant growth is an increase in plant size due to cell division and enlargement. And we measure growth by changes in volume or length, height, surface area, weight. Again, I've already kind of talked about growth, right? Remember when I mentioned primary growth is the lengthening of our plant, secondary growth is an increase in thickness, right? So this is all due to increases in cell division or in cell enlargement. Now, plant development is the progress of a plant through its life cycle. And we'll go a little bit into the life cycle of a plant a little more in, a, in an upcoming lecture. But essentially, think about it all the way from a seed to germination to where it's a young, immature plant. It goes through this process called phase change, which is like puberty for a plant. and becomes a mature plant, uh, which is marked by it being able to reproduce and kind of completes this cycle all over again. All right, so just like any organism, plants have a life cycle, and the ultimate end of that life cycle is senescence, which is deterioration with age and eventually death. Now, what we are going to be looking at in the next couple lectures are some factors that affect both plant growth and development. And I kind of break them down into two categories. So we have our genetic factors, primarily just our genes and environmental factors. So we're gonna to start today by looking at those genetic factors. And it's important to note that these two things, your genes and your environment, work in concert with each other, right? And we're gonna see that in this lecture. So it's not, um, there used to be a big debate about nature versus nurture and you know what makes something, is it their genes? Is it the environment that they grow up in? Uh, it's really both. Right, your genetic, your genes influence, they kind of create this blueprint of what an organism is going to be. And then depending on the different environmental conditions, that is ultimately what that organism is. And we'll look a little bit about that. So let's start with genes, right? I've already mentioned that in a past lecture that a gene is a segment of DNA that codes for a protein. Right, and that's really what it what a gene is. And ultimately what genes do is they determine the traits of an organism. Like I say, they determine those traits in combination with the environment. Now DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's this hereditary material. It carries the instructions for the development and functioning and growth of organisms. It's double helix shaped, so you see it right here, as this sugar phosphate backbone these two backbones, and between them, connecting them, <clears throat> excuse me, are these nucleic acid bases, and I've mentioned them before, and those bases consist of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, and it is the sequence of these bases that ultimately determines what the gene is and what the trait is going to be, right, and uh, in, when we looked at plant cells, we, I talked about that process of uh, gene expression or, or protein synthesis, where we go from a segment of DNA, like we see here, to the creation of an amino acid, an amino acid chain, which is a protein, and then ultimately we get to a trait, such as green eyes here. All right. So again, this starts in the nucleus. We have a section of DNA that gets transcribed into messenger RNA that go, travels to a ribosome, transfer RNA binds to it, and at the other end of that transfer RNA are these amino acids, and those amino acids get piled up as that messenger RNA works its way through the ribosome, and eventually you get a chain of amino acids, which is a protein, and that protein is going to interact with other proteins uh, to eventually create some sort of trait. So if we are looking at an organism at the, on the whole, we have what is referred to as the organism's genotype, which is the entire genetic makeup of an individual. All of the genes are the genotype. And that is really the organism's blueprint, right? It sets the stage 
for what that organism is going to be. And we also have the phenotype, which is the actual observed characteristics of that organism. It's the physical traits and characteristics that we see. And the phenotype is determined by the blueprint, by the genotype, and the environment. So there is something called phenotypic plasticity. And what this is, is that your phenotype, or your morphology, your physiology, or behavior of an organism can change in response to different environmental conditions. So you will have the same genotype, you will have that same set of genes, but depending on the environment that you're found in, it will produce a different phenotype or a different uh, morphology. In the case of our plants here, it will produce different leaf structures or leaf shapes, right? So this is referred to as phenotypic plasticity. And it's particularly important in plants. One of the reasons, because plants are sessile, so that just means they don't move, right? If you are an animal and you are living in a a location that is really suitable for your survival and your growth, and then conditions change, you have the ability to just get up and move to a spot that's better, right? But our plants don't have that ability. They're stuck where they are. So they need to be able to adapt to changing environmental conditions. And one of the ways that they can do it is through this phenotypic plasticity. So if environmental conditions change, they can change their morphology or physiology to better suit those changing environmental conditions. And that is what we see here with our plants. So really, when I look at, when we go in the next couple lectures and look at these environmental factors, we are looking at this phenotypic plasticity of our plants. We're seeing how they can change their growth and development in response to changes in light or temperature, etc. So here are just some examples down here. This is North American watercress. This is an aquatic plant or semi-aquatic plant. And you can see here that temperature will affect the uh, shape and development of the leaves. Right? So this is grown at a colder temperature, uh, these where they get really divided like that, whereas the entire leaves are grown at a warmer temperature. I tried to look up specifics of why that is. It's really interesting. A lot of people talk about the mechanism that temperature affects this, but no one talked about it from an evolutionary standpoint of, of why this happens. Uh, it may have something to do with, uh, so these are semi-aquatic, so typically these divided leaves are found in the water, uh, and these entire leaves are above the surface, so maybe temperature is acting as a proxy for, um, to identify whether the leaves are in water or not. Typically, uh, you're Water in most areas at most times of the year is a little slightly colder than your air temperature. Maybe it has something to do with that. That is just purely speculation on my part. If anyone looks this up, uh, please let the class know because I'd find it really interesting. Um, here is a pitcher plant. We have pitcher plants in New Jersey. You can find them out if you go into a nice wetland area in the Pine Barrens where you guys are. These pitcher plants are Australian pitcher plants and the development of the pitcher leaves that you see here is also related to temperature, right? They'll develop flat leaves at colder temperatures and these pitcher shaped leaves that trap insects at warmer temperatures. Now, um, sometimes these phenotypic changes are related to um, uh, like changes in fitness. So we're trying to improve the um, growth or improve the survival of the plant in some way. Uh, but sometimes it's related to just the building blocks that are available for the plant to use. And an example is hydrangea flower color. So the flower color in your hydrangeas will be different depending on the soil pH level in which the flowers are grown. So at a higher pH level, you will get pink flowers. At a lower pH level, 5.5 or lower, you get blue flowers. And this is all related to aluminum availability. So aluminum is more soluble in lower pHs, so it's more available by the plant to be taken up. Uh, so with those lower pHs, the plant can take in aluminum, and when it does, it uses that to 
uh, use that in this metabolic process that is going to create these blue flowers. So this isn't so much so related to the plant um, trying to improve its fitness or its ability to reproduce or survive, more so that when it has, when the pH is low, aluminum is available and it's going to use it in, in determining its flower color. But then there are, like I said, a lot of instances where the the changes in the phenotype are related to improvements in survival or some sort of evolutionary benefit. And the example here is different growth patterns in relation to light. You guys should have completed your um, pocket seed germination lab. And hopefully what you saw is that the, the seeds that were grown in the dark kind of looked like this, right? They became very elongated as opposed to those that were grown in light. That is referred to, that is a type of photomorphogenesis, which we're going to look at in the next lecture. And in particular, when we're talking about seeds, it's something called scotomorphogenesis. But this is an evolutionary adaptation of our plants. In the seedlings, it's to allow our germinating seedling to get above the soil and get above any sort of leaf matter on top of that soil, right? And we also see it in our uh, mature plants or, you know, plants that have germinated. And it is a type of shade avoidance response. And we're going to go into it next lecture. Uh, more in depth, but it's a way that our plants are able to sense the light around them and then adapt in certain ways or grow in certain ways to maximize their uh, access to that light. And then I just wanted to give a non-plant cool example of how the environment and this phenotypic plasticity occurs uh, across the natural kingdom. And so here a really kind of famous example are the Himalayan rabbits. So the color of the Himalayan rabbit, of their fur, is um, determined by temperature. So at colder temperatures, they will grow a darker fur than at warmer temperatures. So as you see normally, uh, these Himalayan rabbits at the tips of their ears and nose and feet, which are typically colder, will find colder areas on the body, the fur grows in dark but around the core, the fur grows in white. But if you shave a rabbit, shave a Himalayan rabbit, and put an ice pack in that shaved spot, the new fur that grows in is going to be dark because the, the fur color is directly related to the temperature. It's actually really, really neat. I don't know if there's any evolutionary reason for this or if this is something that we just bred into these rabbits. That's uh, kind of a cool... Uh, cool little experiment that you can do if you have a Himalayan rabbit. So, what is the process by which all this occurs? Right, and it is there. We're going to look at some different um, processes that result in these phenotypic changes. Like when I talked about with light, we're going to delve into that a little deep, but. Like I said earlier, sometimes it is just that the building blocks, like if we're looking at these hydrangeas, the building blocks necessary for a certain phenotype are not available in certain conditions, like with a high pH, or they are available in low pH conditions. All right, so that's going to result in these changing phenotypes. But other times, there are the, the organism needs a certain environmental cue that's going to trigger this cascade of effects. And this is where these transcription factors uh, play a role. Right? So transcription factors are special proteins that bind to DNA to initiate DNA transcription and gene expression. They are essentially um, proteins that are going to turn genes on and off. Right? And we said at the beginning here that if you look up here, a genotype of an individual sets the limits within which these different phenotypes can occur. Right now, a lot of what ultimately that phenotype is going to be is related to these transcription factors. So you will have transcription factors that 
if you have a certain environmental condition, it's going to result in these transcription factors binding to DNA and turning on a whole suite of genes that are going to result in a different body plan than if you had different a different environmental condition. And we'll, I'm going to show this later with light, but just as an example, if you have a plant that is grown in light, full sun, it's going to, through this process that we're going to look at, it's going to result in these transcription factors binding to sections of DNA and turning on genes that result in the plant growing relatively smaller and branching out and growing these big leaves as opposed if you have a plant growing in the shade, those transcription factors aren't gonna get turned on and you're gonna result in a body plan that is drastically different. All right, so they're a very, very important part of regulating growth and development from a genetic standpoint, right? And these transcription factors can be a whole host of different types of things from different hormones or enzymes or other metabolites. But you guys should know that they are a type of protein that essentially is going to turn a gene on or off. And they are impacted by different environmental conditions that we will talk about throughout the rest of these next upcoming lectures. Okay, so that is it uh, for the uh, genetic basis of uh, plant growth and development. Remember that... The, a gene is a segment of DNA that codes for a protein that ultimately is going to determine a trait. Your collection of genes is referred to as your genotype, right? That's really the blueprint of an organism. And that blueprint sets the limits for what the phenotype of that organism is going to be. And the phenotype is the, exact, is the observed characteristics of that organism. And what determines that phenotype is your blueprint and... The different environmental conditions that you're exposed to. And with our plants, they have what we what I refer to and what we refer to as phenotypic plasticity. So they can develop different phenotypes, different observed characteristics, based on those different environmental, char environmental conditions in which they're found. And it's important for our plants, particularly because they can't move. They are sessile. They are stuck where they are. So if environmental conditions change, it is advantageous for them to be able to change how they grow or develop to suit those environmental conditions. All right, that is it for this. I uh, hope you guys have a good day.